Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech's show, the state of the state of Hawaii. We're a bi-weekly program on Mondays, and we appreciate your viewership very much. Today, we have a wonderful guest, broadly experienced in the opportunities she has had to serve in Hawaii and uh, become knowledgeable about our state's uh, policies and agencies and all of the things that make it work for us. So we look forward to hearing from Kim Koko Iwamoto about her experience, what she's learned and how we can learn from her. Hi. Hi, Stephanie. Kim, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, welcome to the show and uh, mahalo for your time and, and participation. So I'm really uh, pleased to have a chance to get to know you and your your history and your work and your contribution to Hawaii, um, the state of Hawaii, even more as a result of our conversation here. So um, we are about to know more about advocacy, I think, from you. And you've talked about your ad, your advocacy as legislative advocacy and other, other ways of being an advocate for tenants' rights and also being an advocate for the homeless to get them into stable housing situations. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about what that is and how you do it? And then we can go from here to more specific. How well, I think for many of us uh, who have the honor of serving um, the people of Hawaii in our communities, it happens organically. So for me, um, I got involved um, with the Board of Education because I was a licensed therapeutic foster parent uh, at the time. And I was advocating for my foster kids access to a safe, uh, free education. and. In doing so, um, you know, they asked me to help them address um, the bullying that they and their friends were experiencing uh, in the schools. And this is in the mid 2000s. Um, And so I would go to the Board of Education um, meetings and testify and I would try to get some kind of, um, you know, some kind of acknowledgement that they understood the plight of the students and concerned parents. And they would just look back at the audience with this kind of blank expression with no kind of um, acceptance of responsibility or accountability. So I went back to to my kids and my community and said, I think we need to change things from the inside. And so I ran uh, for office uh, for an elected, at the time it was an elected seat um, for the Board of Education and I was successful. Wonderful. Um, to make it through, yes. Well, and there especially- are quite a few people. Well, especially as you are a parent, <laughs> and in particular, the the foster parenting, uh, we need to have as many of those as we can have. But your point is that, just to get the history right, that the Board of Education, for, for viewers who probably mostly know this, but that it was an elected uh, board for a while, and then it was voted to be an appointed board, appointed by the governor or the-, the That's correct. Executive. Yeah. And uh, and that uh, you had mentioned, Kim, that that's coming back up again as possibly a voter right. issue. Right. So the Board of Education has a, has had a long history of flip flopping between elected and appointed um, over since statehood. It, I think it started off as appointed, then it became elected, uh, then as we know, went to appointed, and now there's the movement to get it back to elected. And generally speaking, I see it. I, I when I experienced this whole transition. It immediately occurred to me to be a red herring for some of the other deeper issues uh, facing education. And when I was on the Board of Education, uh, it was clear to me that the um, the main problem or the root cause of a lot of uh, missed opportunities and distress um, our Department of Education was experiencing was because of a lack or underfunding. Um, you know, this constant, I mean, for, as you know, uh, we have a a disproportionate amount of our students go to private schools. And so oftentimes public schools often ignored the funding uh, for public schools often ignored, and there just isn't as much political will to fund us um, the system adequately. And also what happens is um, the, pri- the private school systems, um, you know, they kind of skim off the very high functioning families, 
the wealthy family, people who have access to a lot of educational support uh, embedded within their within their um, families and within their communities. And so um, the Department of Education has a wonderful task and responsibility of educating um, students with disabilities, students who are coming from different cultures. Um, so, you know, students who have maybe behavioral, emotional situations that got them kicked out of a private school. So, you know, I mean, it's complicated, yeah. right? So yeah. we definitely, it's not tit for tat, like the amount of money that Punahou or Iolani can educate their students with is not gonna be the same because their students have a lot of, um, you know, um, I guess uh, safeguards around them to to make sure that they're kind of more homogeneous in some ways. Um, and so the diversity of, of our student body makes it more expensive to meet the needs of. Well, maybe you can be um, a little helpful for us to understand better how how the funding does go. Of course, it's out of um, the state funding. We're unique, of course, here in Hawaii um, in this in this single school districts situation we have. But um, we've recently received almost a billion dollars of the state of Hawaii, like other states, um, are receiving the federal funding from the CARES Acts and from the ESSER, the Elementary and Secondary Education um, Acts of assistance post-COVID or to get us through COVID and back to um, normal, uh, at least. But we're having lots, I mean, like almost a billion dollars coming in. I think it's like 800 uh, um, million at this point. So when I, uh, so what I'm asking you is, can you tell us a little bit, even though you're not there now, maybe how that works uh, is, how is that going to get all processed? I mean, just so really let me just, I mean, so I think what's clear is that even watching what, happening with a DHHL, Department of Home and Homelands, when you get a windfall, when you're a state agency and you get a windfall amount of money that's out of the norm, uh, comes with a lot of strings and a lot of oversight, a lot of accountability. So obviously expending those funds or spending it down or investing those funds into real life um, impacts for students, it's going to take a lot longer because they're not like a private enterprise where they can just say, yes, let's throw this money there. There's all of this accounting and as you may know, um, the Department of Education is audited, has a financial auditing every single year. Um, so there's a lot of people who are like, oh, we don't know what's going on. Um, we do know. Uh, and it's, it's there in the auditor's report annually. Um, mm -hmm. So I actually don't feel there's any um, misspending. Um, I do think that there's a lot of, you know, it's challenging to find for any, for any employer to hire people. I mean, there are shortages, I think, everywhere right now. And when you pile that onto um, the years and years of underfunding and underpaying teachers for so long and um, not recruiting new teachers, because a lot of people who, for instance, in math and sciences, a lot of uh, people who are inclined to do good works in their community who are gifted in, in math and science, a lot of them are going into nursing because uh, there was there's been traditionally a lot more money and definitely a lot more social respect to some degrees. Um, a lot of the media, because of the advertising that's generated from private schools, a lot of the local media is constantly bashing the public school system, right? Because you're you're making people afraid of the public school system so that they send their kids to private schools and those are your advertisers. So there's this whole kind of relationship that happens. Um, and so, um, so because of all of that, I think it attracting um, public school teachers who are um, impassioned about contributing to their community and who happen to be talented in math and science is going to be harder. Um, so all of these issues kind of, you know, they, they pile on and it just makes it harder to deliver uh, quality yes. public education to the students to, and, and to invest that into the future of Hawaii. But we have to continue trying. And um, yes, yeah, so it's great that we have the money, but we have to have long term funding funding. Um, and one of the issues, too, is something that I witnessed and experienced firsthand with the Department of Education is a lot in the past. I don't know if it's true now, but in the past, the pre and, I, and I was with two different superintendents in the past um, where my feeling and I think they acknowledged this was that the funding, the budget that they asked for was not the budget that they actually needed. 
they sh were shortchanging their own operations because they didn't want to insult or offend the chairs of the education or the chairs of the money committees by asking for too much, right? So they only would ask for what they think they could get um, and not for what was really, really needed to provide uh, the services of quality public education. And so, you know, one of the things and I actually confronted them as a board member, I said, you know, this budget does not reflect the true cost of delivering quality public education. What are you doing? And they said, well, we don't want to upset, mm -hmm. you know, the, the legislature because they'll get really um, upset with us and they'll punish us. <laughs> and which, oh, you know, they'll punish okay. us by <laughs> cutting funding or trashing certain yeah. departments or positions. And that's really and an interesting take on our system, actually. And I mean, it sounds that you're talking about leadership is having the kind of leadership in that position, in those positions. And they do have a new superintendent and also three new superintendent assistant positions. So hopefully there's gonna be some leadership <laughs> that we can see uh, that will get at some of these issues. But yeah, that's that's a very interesting take on it. I, I wanted to, speaking of leadership, you know, go into some of the other ways you've been a leader in, in Hawaii. And especially with regard to the advocacy and for tenants' rights and for the Section 8 housing, uh, the, excuse me, vouchers. So uh, with, with homelessness being such a tremendous challenge and, and really burden for the state, um, there again, we've, we've got people that need to be thinking out of the box to do something about that. And it looks like you just went in full bore <laughs> on how to get stable housing for people. So how does all that work, Kim? Yeah, again, once again, I started my legal career here in Hawaii um, to, as a coordinator of homeless service legal services. So I actually conducted uh, legal clinics in homeless shelters across the state. And then my position, I became a managing attorney, and then I ran all of the legal clinics across the free legal clinics across the state. Um, for you know, individuals who are homeless, who were uh, had experienced domestic violence, um, people who just don't have enough money to hire an attorney. Um, so that I that I began in two thousand and one, and then as I mentioned, I was a foster parent, and um, some of my foster kids had been homeless, had experienced many years of life on the streets with their biological families, um, or because of their biological families didn't want them in their home. Um, so, you know, and the struggles that they had to deal with. And then uh, when I became, um, when I decided to buy a small apartment building in the Ala Moana Kakako area, um, I, at first I was a little hesitant. I didn't know much about Section 8, um, which is a housing subsidy. Um, all I knew was there was a lot of hoops you had to jump through as a landlord. Uh, and so I was always like, you know, I could rent a unit uh, out within 24 hours of it being vacant because my units, I, I cleaned them up. It was kind of a rundown building and I just love renovating and making things nicer. So um, my units would go really quickly. And then at the thought of actually um, not bringing in uh, a rental income um, and leaving that apartment vacant while Section 8 had to inspect it and I had to wait uh, longer for that, um, mm -hmm made it really challenging. And then I realized actually how much more Section 8 um, actually subsidizes. So my Section 8 units um, do um, pay quite a bit, especially for my zip code, which is 96814. Um, mm -hmm. So it's based on zip code uh, is the amount Section 8 will actually um, provide that subsidy, uh, the limit. So it's quite economically from a business point of view, it's a it's a it's a sound business decision, um, and then during COVID, when well, just families now on that that yeah. section, um, uh, the zip code area, you know, fourteen, yes. 14, 14 and that's right next to nine six eight fifteen, which is evidently the highest property values, uh, you know, in the country. But yeah, um, yeah. So so what you were saying though with the the zip code of the fourteen is that there. The, the vouchers were adequate or, or, or getting close. Yes, yeah, so I could. Let me tell you the difference for yeah. for why and I, for instance, a, you know, a one bedroom, the maximum subsidy that Section 8 will pay. And this is for 2022. And so it's probably changed for 2023. But it was uh, $1,330 
But if you rented a one bedroom apartment in Kailua to the same Section 8 family, you know, if they moved, uh, you could get up to $2,500. You know, and so for 96814, it was uh, for a one bedroom, it's um, uh, $2,020 for a one bedroom. So this, there's a huge, Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, um, a range of, um, yeah, amounts that Section 8 will pay. And it's because, you know, I think, I I think it's fair to say that certain districts, uh, the property values are more expensive. So if you're looking at a landlord who has a higher mortgage, you Mm want to make sure that that landlord can cover it. Um, So, yeah. And so. So how are you eligible? Are you going to, let, let's hear how you're eligible for a Section 8 voucher. Who are they? You know what? It's really, really challenging. So they do, when they're, when the window of application does open and it opens oftentimes for like six hours or six days, it's like so a crazy tiny window because there are so few vouchers. They're like, why leave the window open if we're going to have to just deny so many people? So they leave it open for a little while. Um, And they do usually give um, preferential treatment if you have a child, if Mm. you have a disability, if you're over 62. Uh, Mm. So there's all of these kind of things that get you a higher um, eligibility ranking. Um, And so and then also if you are homeless, uh, then there might be routes, especially because there is so much money now coming in to address homelessness. And so 50 percent of my tenants uh, in my building um, either have been homeless or they would be homeless, but for their Section 8 subsidy. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's a a a community that, you know, I I don't have in emotional resistance to people who've been exper- who've experienced homelessness because um, I just know how hard it is for a, a lot of people economically, health-wise, um, all of these different factors. And I what also what I know is that um, our own sitting county, um, you know, the the management of our, our houses population and providing temporary shelter. Even we don't even have enough temporary shelter for fifty percent of those who are currently unhoused so when the police come and they're like okay you gotta go to a shelter there's in fact no shelter there's no beds available and and they know that so that's why it just feels cruel just just disrupt or disturb um somebody just to Mm -hmm. upheave them and when there's no actual solution so as much money yeah well what about you as the landlord how do you get to a are there criteria that the landlord must meet? Oh, it just needs to be a very safe. They come out and inspect. So it does it does take a little bit longer? But as I mentioned earlier, um, the the rental rates because of that gap mm-hmm. in a uh, vacancy gap because of the the regulations. I do charge the the maximum uh, mm-hmm. because it is vacant. That when it is vacant, it does take a while, mm-hmm. uh, or not the maximum, but at least more than what somebody else who's been living there for a long time will pay. Um, so yes, and so um, so as a landlord, um, and I wish they would. I wish they would put us on a special list, like oh, we've worked with this landlord, and they're good, and they're you know, and they can just use their phone to inspect. Like just show us with your phone, you know, FaceTime the inspector, push your your smoke detector, you know, sh- turn on all your water taps. You can do that all with fa- like a Facebook phone or just, you know, a Zoom thing on your phone. I think there's other ways to do it to make the inspector's job easier. So, you know, whether whether they go in that direction or not um, in terms of waiting for the inspection. But once it's inspected and, and certified that it's good for, for habitable, uh, it's safe and habitable, mm-hmm. then um, then it's just a matter of finding the right tenant. And so then it's just about working with the different organizations who are trying to find permanent housing. And then clients. you receive enough then with those kinds of vouchers at those levels, which seem thoughtful about what it really takes to have a property in those areas or be in a property in those areas. Then those allow you to get your mortgages paid and right. keep your property up to standards right, right. so and so, yes and yeah. again during covid when people were losing their jobs when non section 8 tenants were losing work right they were being furloughed or they were being you know they just weren't working as many hours or they lost their job completely 
Um, so some of the tenants who had Section 8, we didn't have to worry about that. So they actually provided more stability during economic turbulent times. Uh, so that was a good, so maybe it's good as an investor to think yeah. about your por keeping your portfolio diverse. Mm -hmm. So I strongly encourage um, landlords out there to consider, you know, having at least 50% of your tenants be Section 8 so that you, if we go through something similar um, as we did with the pandemic, that you can kind of ride that out a little bit more smoothly. Um, now, there was a lot of rental relief. So even the, the tenants yeah, who weren't were. able to pay, they did eventually, the bookkeeping did get resolved. But- That's um, generous, yes. Well, what about um, a relief uh, for the lack of affordable housing? Do you see this? I mean, am I jumping to conclusions here? But Kim, I mean, is this an area that could be enhanced so that there would be more? Uh, but it has to do with whether the state's going to uh, pr provide the vouchers, right? Yeah, and what, yes, the we definitely need more here for vouchers. Helping out the problem, getting people into stable homes. Is this a way to work on doing that? Yes, and I think if we just said we're going to increase our Section 8 budget, that would go a long ways to helping more people. That? who truly need the help. I mean, it's a, it's a solution that's yeah. out there. And I think all of the, the policymakers who are, you know, um, putting money towards certain things, they are aware uh, of that as, a, as an option for sure. Um, yeah, so- Where is that? Well, where would a person work on, on, on influence or, you know, requesting that kind of change? How, how could a person advocate? Tell us about how you would advocate for increased, uh, that val of Section 8 vouchers. Are people working on this now? Are there any groups or people that are trying to influence the leg legislation? Yeah, it's interesting because, um, well, one of the, the one of the issues is that, right, developers are huge campaign contributors. So a lot of developers want more money to build more affordable housing. And then the issue arises affordable for who? Like a lot of the developers who are building affordable, when I asked them, I said, oh, are you actually open to renting to Section 8? A lot of them say, oh, no, I, I don't even, I haven't even thought of that. <laughs> but we can actually say you must rent to Section 8. And in your zip code that you want to build this new tower, this is the limit. Can you work with that? Like there's ways of doing this. Uh, also, yeah. what landlords should know is that there is a slush fund for landlords if your tenant actually, um, you know, again, this is a fear fantasy that Section 8 tenants are going to destroy the property, which has not been my experience, um, and more so than a non-Section 8 person, right? And so there is so the slush fund for this, uh, for landlord kind of um, putting things back together. It has so much money in it because no one's really using it. So the fear Easy. of the destruction is greater than the reality. So yeah, so that's another incentive for for a yeah. landlord who's kind of like you know trying to get over their own internal bigotry. You well, know, and, and, yeah. And speaking of Kakaako, we've got Howard Hughes in here who's not even finished planning yet all of the buildings that he's putting up. And so I would imagine um, may, maybe that's the kind of landlord or situation where they're not they're not thinking about including Section 8 housing vouchers. In, in yeah. Accommodating. No. They are required to provide low cost housing, but that where that's another place where there could be a requirement that they also do that. Yes, it's yes. So there's many opportunities to to actually address the needs. Um, yeah of these various communities. How are we doing on time? Is there anything else we want to- have a few wanna... more minutes to go. And so, yes, I was just thinking of all the things we've been speaking of and where what else we might want um, to get you to speak to. Well, because... one of the hats I, yeah. I also wear is, um, I, along with some other um, small business owners, started a group called the Chamber of Sustainable Commerce. Uh, basically, we believe that we can uh, strengthen our economy without hurting workers, consumers, um, communities, or the environment. And, and one of the reasons why uh, what got us, and this is two years ago in, in 2021, we launched 
Um, and we've had meet and greets on Oahu, on the Big Island, on Maui, and we look forward to expanding to Molokai and um, uh, and other parts of and Kauai as well. Um, so we're going to be actually providing a voice uh, for small businesses um, to to network, but also to set policy or at least, you know, weigh in on policy that the traditional chambers of commerce don't always, um, you know, we're not always aligned. And so we need an alternative voice for business. Um, for instance, uh, we supported shutting down Red Hell and one of the other chambers actually wrote a uh, testimony in opposition to shutting down Red Hell, um, which is kind of wild when you think about um, I know there are businesses on on base that have been hurt by um, the lack of, you know, clean water available to to consumers. And so you would think that all the chambers of commerce would have supported Ernie Lau's, um, you know, fight to to shut down Red Hell before before the contamination occurred. But no, they they sided on the side of um, of poisoning our aquifer um, because they thought that that would be better for their client, the businesses that they represent. And so I just wanted to, we just wanted to make sure that, uh, that the people of Hawaii and legislators and policymakers know that there are actual other business people here who care about, you know, our workers and consumers and the people of Hawaii and the environment um, while, while still being profitable and, and sustaining um, our families and our investors. Well, that is that is a wonderful effort, and uh, we've we've shown the um, your your web page up on on ThinkTech, and uh, people can see it there. And if they're interested to um, contact you, the information is there. And that what what other kinds of projects would you have? What do you want to see a person come in and be eager to do? What's an example of that in addition to the Red Hill crisis? Right. Well, obviously, so there are other issues that we need to focus on. Um, obviously, corruption at the legislature. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who feel that that benefits uh, corporate lobbyists who can make a lot of very high priced co campaign contributions, this pay to play thing. And then it would leave a lot of small businesses kind of out in the dust um, to have that kind of inequity of access to policymakers. So, you know, reaching out, um, just making sure that those standards and ethics are maintained is really important. Um, good. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and there's uh, obviously, you know. Like, absolutely. Uh, we need something like that. Is there anything already operating that's like that? Is it, Are you filling in a space or are there other people in that space out there? Well, there are other, there, like there's a chamber for West Hawaii Chamber of Commerce. Mm -hmm. um, they are quite progressive around environmental issues. Mm -hmm. um, so that's great. And we look forward to uh, aligning with a lot of their positions. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, so hopefully we're adding and, and fortifying the, the, the business community's voice on issues that affect mm -hmm. all of us. You know, I think about the book, The Lorax, you know, the Dr. Seuss book. <laughs> about this basically it was a business of making sweaters but unfortunately you know capitalism went haywire and the business basically became um uh obsolete because there was no no more resources to make sweaters there was no more workers because everything was polluted no water mm -hmm. uh no trees and it's, it just made everything unsustainable and so that mm -hmm. so that kind of striving for profit and production at any cost um, is not sustainable. And so that's kind of the, the model. I like to compare what Very we're trying good. to do. Yeah. Well, you've put the word into what's well known, <laughs> well known the Chamber of Commerce. Like it's sustainable in there and it, it's got purpose and mission um, that, that needs to, to, to get work, get to work. Well, I think we are uh, are short on time. We're out of time and it's been a pleasure to have you in this conversation, Kim, and um, we've been talking about at your advocacy, and also we did cover some uh, education issues uh, that abide in our state, and we are on the road here to trying to make everything better, and especially through the kind of advocacy that you you do and you've explained to us and 
now we know about a new a new nonprofit out there to, to do some critical work for the state too. So thank you very much, Kim. Thank you. Thank you so and, much, Stephanie. Yeah. And mahalo to our viewers and uh, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.